Have you heard of some supplements that claim to be able to improve bone health but also fix women's hormones? I use that last part in quotes because those are not my words, those are theirs. But I've heard these claims too, and there might be some truth behind them, but I wanna take a deep look into the details of some of these products because one of the biggest errors I see when people are building their own bone health program is that they put too much faith into these products that are maybe unlikely to help them as much as they claim they are. One of the challenges I see here is that if you're using DEXA as your primary tool to measure improvement, that it can take one or two years to show a difference. So if you're only verifying your plan is working every two years, then it's really important to make good decisions around the tools that you're using. There is a big difference between some tools that are reported to improve bone health but only slow down bone loss versus tools that are actually going to show through research that they can build bone, not only compared to placebo, because we know that's bone loss, but compared to baseline. So it's really important that we look deep at the literature, really look at the results to show, are we actually building bone from baseline are we building bone compared to placebo? Or are we actually just preserving bone compared to placebo? Because those are three very different things. So before we get into this, I'm curious, what do you think is the strongest tool in your toolbox for your bone? If you're on YouTube, please leave that in the comments because I would love to hear what you think the best tool is that you're using right now. So a few weeks ago, I did a video on the potential benefits of these things called phytoestrogens. Now, phytoestrogens are these hormone-like products that are in soy and other foods, and you can see that video, I believe, over here. One of the takeaways from that video was that while soy and other foods do have these things called phytoestrogens in them, and that they can benefit bone health and hormone health, because of the potential negatives of soy, particularly for some individuals, getting all that active ingredient of soy in a supplement might actually be better than getting it from soy itself. But the big question is this, how effective is it? So I'm gonna show you exactly how we use one of these products with patients, but first, let me give you a little background. So soy and other similar foods like flax seeds have these, again, phytoestrogens. Now phytoestrogens are compounds that again have similar structure to estradiol, which is the dominant estrogen in both women and men. And these phytoestrogens can activate estradiol receptors in the body resulting in potentially some of the benefits, which is pretty cool. Some of the active ingredients in these compounds are called isoflavones. And this is where like things get challenging, but again, we're gonna talk about these isoflavones. In my last video, we talked about the most potent isoflavone in soy, which is called genistein. Supplement manufacturers have capitalized on this a little bit. I think there's still room for growth here, actually, in the industry. But they've capitalized on this a little bit in this particular isoflavone. So now there are products that are marketed specifically for bone health, also for hot flashes and other symptoms of menopause. But they are specifically with this compound and then combined, again, with a, a couple of other things. And we'll talk about that in some of the supplements at the end and some of the things that we have found and are potentially recommending. But whenever we're translating this uh, idea of taking a compound from a whole food source and putting it in a supplement, we do need to take that next step and find out actually does it work. So if we take this one thing out of food and we use it in an isolated supplement, is it the same or is it less or is it better, more effective than using it from the food itself? Because sometimes there's synergistic compounds in whole foods that are going to help something to work better rather than that compound itself. So fortunately, there is some research that we can look at specifically on genistein as a supplement, and we can also get a sense of dosing, and then we can translate that into what kind of products are available on the market. All right, so let's look at this first study. So this is a 2013 review paper, which is always a good place to start because you're going to basically learn what other researchers have learned about these things by reading a whole bunch of studies. So basically, this one is on genistein and one other isoflavone, but very specifically genistein, they talk about it having dual functions on bone cells. It's basically able to both inhibit bone resorption of, of osteoclasts and then also stimulate osteogenic or bone building cells differentiation and maturation. So it's cool. You're working on both sides of the equation of bone metabolism, which we, is what we want to do uh, and most natural products do. So they go on to describe genistein and its selectivity for estrogen receptors as a little bit imbalanced. So it has a greater affinity for estrogen receptor beta rather than alpha. And there's some potential negatives there because now we're going to be imbalanced in stimulating these estrogen receptors. If you look at natural hormones like estradiol, it actually stimulates them equally. Um, so this is going to be a little bit different and there's some potential negatives with that, but also some potential positives. 
And then the second study I pulled actually looks at genistein at a very specific dose. So this is a 54 milligram dose, and that'll become important later when we start looking at products. But a 54 milligram dose, and then they talk about the impact, again, on both bone building and on bone breakdown. So again, natural products working on both sides of the equation, and that's pretty cool. So we do also have some randomized control trials to go through. And so that RCT data, I'm going to show you. But before I do, if you're having a hard time putting together all of the potential uh, tools and information that there's available on bone health, you may want to consider coming to our free masterclass. That masterclass we run every one to two weeks. I run it myself. We spend about 45 minutes going through how we build a program. Then we have about 15 minutes for questions. So if you haven't done that yet, strongly encourage you to do it totally free. Look for the link in the description on YouTube, or if you're listening to this on a podcast, go to optimalhumanhealth.com and you can access the link there. Okay, so this randomized control trial that I want to show you is a pretty good trial. This is back from 2009, and it has 183 women, again, using the same dose of 54 milligrams per day. So this is sort of the kind of standard dose that we see in the human studies. And now what's interesting about this study is they used a quantitative ultrasound. So if you've heard me talk about REMS, this is kind of, kind of like a REMS idea, but not the same device. And then they did also fortunately look at bone mineral density of the spine and the hip. And they tested bone both at one and two years of treatment. So we have two years of data, which is pretty awesome. Uh, and then they also looked at ultrasound parameters of improvement. And so what they found is that the, uh, the ultrasound did show improvements uh, from you know, these different variables of, of bone uh, and what it looks like under ultrasound, which is a little bit hard for me to interpret. But most importantly, the bone mineral density did improve compared to placebo. Now, the statistics are a little bit confusing, but when you look at this, at one year in the femoral neck, which is the hip, the intervention group was up 2.32%, which is pretty cool. The spine was up at 2.68% compared to negative 1.63% in the hip and negative 2.12% in the spine. So those are pretty dramatic differences. And then continue to follow that at the two year mark, you have in the intervention 4.54% versus negative 3.92%. So now we're talking about a 7% swing between placebo and intervention. And that swing is even bigger in the spine. So you have uh, positive 5.25% in spine versus negative 3.74%. So those are really big changes. Now, it's a little unclear from a statistics perspective how they actually got those numbers. And I think they're comparing um, I think they're comparing the improvement to placebo and vice versa. So I think it's going to cause them to look bigger than they really are. But still, it's pretty good. And, you know, this is a relatively natural product. So pretty low risk. So something certainly worth considering. So speaking of that risk, you might be asking, well, I'm a little concerned about this, the estrogen receptor thing. So what if, you know, is this the same thing as estrogen? Like, does it, does it have the same risks as estrogen? So I'm not going to talk about all the potential risks and benefits of estrogen here. Um, I have other videos on that. But the challenge here is that, yes, it they do interact with estrogen receptors. So anybody that is at risk of having a complication of estrogen may want to talk to their doctor before uh, starting this. In fact, of course, anybody should talk to their medical team before starting anything I talk about on YouTube. Um, but for example, somebody who either has breast cancer, who's being treated for breast cancer, has a history of breast cancer, and has been told that they need to stay away from estrogen, they need to essentially block all estrogen, that's something to consider. Any estrogen-sensitive um, uh, cancer would be relative uh, in this space to be something to be concerned about. There may also be some concerns around premenopausal women, perimenopausal women. If you're still making estrogen, this could actually drive your levels up. And if you're imbalanced, this could cause some hormone imbalance. So I'm talking about this most specifically in my, my postmenopausal uh, uh, patient group because we don't have to worry because they're not making any estrogen uh, or at least very, very little. So we're not going to have any issues with estrogen overload uh, with a product like a phytoestrogen. So plenty of women are taking this in the premenopausal status um, and they find benefit from it, but you might also see some negative impact on potentially fertility, also cycle dysfunction. You say may see some dysfunction of, of menstrual cycles, actually potentially worsening of symptoms around your cycle. So again, this is something to be used with caution um, in that age group. There is also some concern around some interaction with hormonal birth control, which I strongly advise against anyway, uh, but another reason not to take hormonal birth control. There are some other medications this might interact with. So again, because it's working through hormone receptors and hormones are very powerful, there's a lot of things to consider here. So you may want to check, or at least you definitely should check if you're on medications with your doctor about potential interactions. 
Other things that people have noticed when they take these specific types of supplements is that there might be some GI discomfort. You remember too that this is a specific compound that we're getting out of a natural product, right? So we're taking a, a isoflavone out of soy, we're condensing it, we're putting it in a capsule, and then we're putting it in your body. So while it is natural, it is in an unnatural form because you're not gonna get that much genistein out of soy unless you eat a whole lot of soy. Not actually that much, but still more than certainly taking a capsule. There's also some concern of an increased risk of cancer because of the imbalance of estrogen receptor beta over alpha. I don't know that I believe that. Um, there's no clear evidence on that, so take that for what it is. Men should also be careful here because if we are overstimulating estrogen receptors in men and we don't have enough androgen or testosterone stimulation to balance it, then you might also uh, run into some issues of uh, potentially, you know, the estrogen sensitive things like actually breast tenderness, swelling, potentially changes in mood, et cetera. So where do you get this kind of product? So I looked at a few different options here, and the one that really stood out to me was actually a Designs for Health product called FemGuard. Now, this is probably not going to be exciting for my male audience, but uh, there's a product called FemGuard, which is combined with a couple other things, and they all check out as far as something that is reasonable to take for a postmenopausal woman who's not on estrogen. So I think that's probably the sweet spot for this group. Um, but again, there are all these potential considerations. So this is the one that we're looking at as a product for our patient population. Now, most of our patients are going to be on estrogen, so we're not going to end up recommending this product. Um, and I have no financial relationship with Designs for Health. Um, however, our HSN members do get a discount from our full script dispensary. So if that's something that you're looking for, it's something that you could consider. So that's it for this product. If you would like to look at other supplement uh, videos that we have out right now that are recent, we have this video called Raw Milk in a Capsule. And so this is all about lactoferrin, which is a really cool supplement to talk about. And then we also have our best supplement for osteoporosis in 2024. And that video is here as well. So remember that osteoporosis as a diagnosis is not the end, but deciding to reverse it is a beginning. I'll see you in the next video.